following contains spoilers for Persona. Viewer discretion is advised. This week, I wanted to put out a new video. It's been a while since I've put one out. That being said, I wanted to get it out before Thanksgiving, so I'm going to do it more podcast style. The video editing is going to be a little looser. You'll probably just see scenes from Persona kind of just cycle over and over. This is more for listening rather than viewing. That's so I can get it out before Thanksgiving, because otherwise I wouldn't have the time. Gotta get stuff ready. And I know it's been a while since my last video, I've had other stuff coming up, but I want to start putting content out. So if you like the style, let me know. If you hate it, let me know. I just thought maybe if you wanted to listen to me talk about Persona, this would be just kind of a way to get back into it. Uh, that being said, it, there is a trigger warning for eating disorders, and I know people have a preconceived notion about trigger warnings. Um, but I'm going to talk about eating disorders and trauma, both of which can have psychological triggers that can worsen someone who's experienced something like this, maybe just isn't in a place to listen to it right now. So if you identify with that, I encourage you to turn this off. That is perfectly okay. Uh, if you want to keep listening, though, I do try my best to tackle the subjects very lightly. I do try to handle the language in more of like a group therapy setting of experiencing X symptom or Y symptom. I don't try to go into super a lot of detail, but I will be talking about instances that are shown in the Persona games, uh, specifically 5 and specifically Q. That being said, those games are both great examples and not great examples of eating disorders. That being said, media in itself has not portrayed eating disorders in a great way. Usually you see people as the manic pixie dream girl, which I know the person who hated the term hates that term now. But you're thinking of, I believe it's Cassie from Skins. You're thinking about the quirky white girl who's thin and teenage and just wants to feel beautiful. That is the media portrayal of eating disorders. And it's really unfortunate because it kind of reinforces some negative stereotypes. So it reinforces the idea that eating disorders only affect women. Uh, it reinforces the idea that only white women are affected by this. It reinforces the idea that you have to be underweight in order to have an eating disorder. And all of those are problematic, not just because it's like, oh, you're portraying me poorly. It's also problematic because people who don't fit into those molds won't necessarily either know that they need help or might have difficulty finding help because unfortunately psychologists and doctors although there are many caring people in that field there are also a lot of people who succumb to those stereotypes because they are influenced by the same media uh, oftentimes you get half an hour, hour lecture at most about eating disorders in med school. So it's kind of, it's hard. It's difficult. The treatment is costly. Usually the only way you get treatment, especially, I mean, my experience is in the Canadian healthcare system. And although it is definitely at least on par with the American system, it's very difficult to get a bed, even though it's covered, unless you're actively underweight, and at a serious health risk to yourself. Although everyone with an eating disorder does have a health risk to themselves that's very serious, the reason for this is that there's such a lack of funding. So there is 120 beds, I believe, that might be wrong now. I believe that was a statistic in Ontario. In Ontario, to give you an idea, like, it is the most populated area of Canada. Like, 70% of the population, and that statistic isn't exact either. But that's the most populated area of the province. That is not a lot, considering that from one statistic, in the US, there are as many people with eating disorders as there are people with green eyes. So that is a fair amount of people, right? So there's a lot of stuff around that. So media portrayal has not been great to eating disorders. And portrayal in video games for eating disorders hasn't really existed. It's harder to portray than something like anxiety or depression. It's not something that's fun to talk about. And overall, it just, it sucks, you know? And when I say that 
the idea that anyone with an eating disorder is white or a woman or underweight as like the typical media portrayal. I feel like I should go over some of the different eating disorders that exist. So right now in the DSM, they have something called rumination disorder, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder. And then there is OSFED, which is other specified feeding or eating disorder. Now, the thing is, is that most people portray eating disorders as the anorexia nervosa stereotype. And the other reason why that is so toxic is because even people with eating disorders feel like they are not sick enough, they are not doing their job well enough if they don't have this appearance. And, I mean, it's problematic. It sucks. Um, but that's why I also wanted to talk about persona because eating disorders in and of themselves are not just a reflection of how you look. It's not that shallow. Although... Many of the disorders have a very self-judgmental view, a very specific want to look a certain way. There's a multitude of reasons why they exist. And the very last one is just wanting to be pretty. Like that is a really shitty perception and really problematic. And I've said problematic like 12 times because this isn't scripted, but I stick by that. Now, there are many reasons, so trauma can be one of them, um, because there's a need for control. A lot of eating disorders either have a basis in a lack of control or a need for more control, Uh, perfectionism. There's a lot to unpack, and it's different for every single individual, so I'm not speaking for anyone. I can only speak from my own experiences with what I've seen of this disorder, what I've experienced myself. Now, that being said... I think that Persona, specifically Persona 5 and Persona Q, actually have really good and really bad portrayals of eating disorders, but they lean closer to really good. And they don't do so intentionally. I don't think the writers have a huge background in this stuff. So first, I kind of just wanted to dip into Persona 5, and I'm specifically talking about Makoto. Like, there is this kind of scene on the beach where it's implied she hasn't eaten today because she's going to the beach, she's caring about her body, and Mona says that you shouldn't do that. And, I mean, that's actually pretty typical, especially not only in our culture, but in Japanese culture, of looking a certain way. So it's not specifically just that I'd want to hypothesize that it's like, yes, Koto has an eating disorder because one time she wanted to eat a little less to look like she wanted in her bathing suit. That is not what I'm trying to say. But what you do see is, I believe it's in the art book that kind of talks about how like she's really specific about what she eats. And there's... A eating disorder that I don't believe is listed in the DSM-5, and if it has, it's in an amended version because the DSM-5 is supposed to be amended every now and then, but it's orthexia, which is the idea that you disguise your eating disorder as healthy living, clean living, like working out, Instagram, everything like that is considered an eating disorder. And it's not that every single person who tries to do stuff like that has an eating disorder. Um, It says that in this culture where it's acceptable to do that, people can hide behind that as their own eating disorder. So they'll get very anxious about not eating that way. So a person who does not have a mental disorder may strive to always eat clean, eat the quote-unquote clean, things that they deem as nutritious, but at their nephew's birthday party, they'll eat some pizza and cake because that's what's there. And they don't really care. They just it's whatever. It's not a big deal. Someone who does have a problem would have problems breaking their own rules. So that's being said, like, always having to eat what they prepared, always having to make sure that X food or Y food isn't involved in this, getting very anxious if they can't control their own stuff, 
following a very strict fitness schedule. Again, following fitness schedule isn't necessarily bad, but when it comes to say, again, your best friend got a job promotion. She wants you to go out with her and she, you're like, no, I have to go work out at the gym. It, it's being willing to let go in certain situations. Like it's not a control thing. It's just something you like doing and you want to try to do, but it's not like the end of the world if you can't. And for someone who's suffering from this, it can be, but it's socially acceptable. And again, saying that just because Makoto is very strict about what she eats and make sure it's nutritious that in of itself doesn't make it an eating disorder either. And I'm not going to try to say she does have an eating disorder. But in through a certain lens, it can be a good example. Uh, if you look at stuff that Makoto struggles with, and that's perfectionism, trying to do her best with what people want her to be, what she wants to be perceived as, those are very much characteristics of someone who could develop an eating disorder, as well as, you know, trauma from losing parents, that sort of thing. Eating disorders are hereditary. So that means that if someone in your family has an eating disorder, especially in your immediate family, you're much more likely to develop one yourself, even without social influences. So there are biological markers behind it, so to speak. Um, but it kind of goes back to the bucket theory. And I really like the bucket theory. I'm not sure if I've discussed it on my channel before, but I used to shove it down the grad student's throat that I used to teach at my clinic. And it's the theory that we all have this bucket, right? And we put all of life shit into this bucket and eventually it overflows. And everyone has a different size bucket. Um, usually it's about the same size bucket as maybe your parents. And it's this idea that it's a threshold. It's not like you have these genetic markers, you're going to have an eating disorder. But for one person, they might get a bad grade once and that can be the start of a spiral of an eating disorder. And that doesn't seem like a big deal to some people, but for that person, their size bucket was really small. That's what they could have handled. For other people, they could go through the trauma of losing parents, they could go through trauma of losing their job, of different sexual assault, this and that, and still not develop an eating disorder because um, their size bucket is bigger. And that's why it's also really hard to say that someone's struggle isn't worthy. And that's why a lot of people in therapy kind of say like, oh, I know people have it worse than me. So I don't know why I'm complaining. And that in and of itself is really problematic because it's like, hey, if it has affected you and it is hurting you, then it's worthy. There's not really a, this is the marker you have to hit to be fucked up kind of thing. Not that people with mental disorders are fucked up. I am more speaking from a place of having struggled with my own mental disorders and struggling with that own question of, are my struggles worth it? Like, are, am I worthy to be struggling right now? And the answer is, as long as you're struggling, you're worthy to be struggling. It's not like a contest. It's not that you get to be messed up if you get this certain point. If you feel, if you feel personally that you're messed up and you want to get help and you're trying to work stuff out, then that's you. And again, I'm not using that language towards other people with mental health disorders. I'm kind of just speaking from myself. And sometimes I use that language not so much to be like, hey, I'm so fucked up and no one understands me, but more so like admitting like, hey, I can admit that I'm struggling right now. So that's a personal choice in language. And that's a whole other subject about personal choice of language. That's a tangent. So going back to Makoto, she kind of has all the markers of struggling with something like this, of wanting to be better, wanting to be like her sister, wanting to achieve goals that are very lofty, of having issues with control, of being concerned about her appearance, of controlling what she eats. And again, not necessarily saying that she does have an eating disorder. That's not what I'm saying at all. But those are all factors that could lead into an eating disorder. And I kind of would like if she did, but it wasn't explicitly stated because it doesn't go into this trope of like Joker comes in and saves her from the evil eating disorder or like there's this other trope in media where it's like, oh, the girl with the eating disorder and our mental health issues just needed to find love and now she's better or 
The guy with the mental health problems just needed to find love, and the quirky girl helped him, and now he's better. Um, it kind of just shows like all these little factors that could lead into something like that. Now, with the awakening of her persona, it's implied that she kind of has accepted that part of her that needed perfection and all of that sort of thing. So it could be that maybe if she had not awoken her persona, that perhaps she would have struggled with something like that due to those extenuating factors. Now, the second game I wanted to talk about was Persona Q. And obviously, I'm going to be talking about Ray, And it is kind of like a cute quirk that she's like, I want to eat everything. There's corn dogs. There's takoyaki. And like, I got to say that sometimes I identify with that girl. Like, yes, I also want all that food. But what is kind of telling is later in the game, Zen says something along the lines of maybe she just wanted to feel alive. And that's why she keeps eating. And... There's some interesting things to unpack there. So I'm going to talk about the problematic first in that someone with a binge eating disorder, um, I'm going to say that it would be under kind of a binge eating disorder criteria rather than uh, bulimia because we don't see any indication that she's restricting or she's doing anything, any behaviors in order to make up for her caloric intake. Um, usually we do see weight gain, whether it's dramatic or not, we do see that weight gain and we don't see that with Ray. So to truly say like this is a binge eating disorder, it kind of makes it cutesy because she doesn't gain weight. And a lot of times people who are overweight are seen in a very negative light and aren't taken as seriously or a joke and people who have problems with eating aren't seen as people who need help even though they have health risks just like anorexia they are kind of viewed as just lazy and that's the culture we live in so that part can't be a very good parallel um, that being said, if you look at, again, that statement of Ray wanting to feel more alive, but also the idea that she's traumatized and she's lost her memories. Now, it's kind of implied, I think, I might be wrong because I'm just spitballing here, that Zen locked away the memories. But when they start unlocking the memories, Zen gains his memory back and Ray doesn't. Um... And we don't know if she just doesn't gain her memories back or she's just trying to repress them. But there's this idea of dissociation. And dissociation is defined as a psychological process where someone disconnects from reality, their thoughts or feelings, or loses memories and their sense of identity. It's a coping mechanism from the mind to protect a person from a traumatic event. It allows them to switch off and distance themselves from a situation they can't handle and observe rather than being a part of it. Um, that's from robertsteclinic.co.nz. So what we see in binge eating disorders, usually people with trauma, it's a way to disconnect. It's a way to numb pain. Uh, the consumption of food does increase endorphins. It does create those good feelings because of the idea that, hey, your body wants to encourage yourself to eat because eating's good and Eating allows you to survive. It is a survival instinct. Uh, so you get all these feel-good feelings when you eat food. But it can be a way to numb. Uh, it's like any addiction. But it has been argued that eating disorders are worse than other addictions, like drug addictions or alcohol addictions or sex addictions, that sort of thing, because you can't abstain from food. It's not something where... You say, hey, I had a problem with alcohol. I know eventually I'll have to come across in my everyday life, but for now I'm going to avoid going to the bar. I'm going to avoid going to parties that have alcohol until I get my shit together because right now I just can't handle it, which there's nothing wrong with that. We all have baby steps to get where we want to be. We can't necessarily do that with food because if you avoid food, you're going to have a different problem. If you don't eat, you're going to die and... So it becomes much trickier to deal with those sort of things. 
So when we look at Ray and her unwillingness to remember things, uh, her concentration on food to the point of obsession, it really, although is portrayed as a cute quirk, it later is shown in a much darker light. And I think it's actually presented pretty well because it again isn't concentrating on the idea that it's about obsession of looks. And although Ray is again a small blonde girl who's super cute, it's more so concentrating on the fact that she has this trauma that she's avoiding. She has these memories that she's avoiding, that she hates herself. Like she had the idea feeling she never wanted to have been born at all because of the pain she went through, feeling abandoned, of not even having a name that was, you know, her own. She has a name, Nico, which literally just means second child. Like, she wasn't, she didn't feel like a real person. She was jealous of her friend for getting to live, which I'm sure, because Ray is portrayed as someone who cares a lot about other people, that she probably felt horrible about herself for feeling that way. And then we also see that Ray does look a little younger than how she looked as Nico, and that's interesting in and of itself as well because there's this need to forget if all these horrible things happen to her at this age. Even though she was sick her whole life, she did seem happier when she was younger. She did seem to have some kind of relationship with her mother when she was younger. And it's a very typical thing for people to deal with trauma, with food, with overconsumption, with wanting love and acceptance and replacing food with that. So even though it's problematic that they show her as, again, a thin girl, it's also shown in a really good light of showing the trauma that can be behind that kind of stuff and how something silly and lighthearted might be a struggle for somebody else. So... That was my talk, and it was a little long, and I hope you guys found it interesting. I know I just kind of rambled a lot. I don't know if you'll like this style. I don't know if it'll get views, but that's neither here nor there. I just wanted to put something out. Uh, if you like the style, then I can do more videos like this. I They do tend to be a little longer because I can go on tangents, and tangents are always fun, um, or not if you hated it, but whatever. So I also wanted to give a shout out to my Patreons because you're the reason I can do what I do and I really appreciate it. If you want to see videos a day early, if you guys want to join a special Discord channel on the fan site, if you guys just want to bullshit, um, consider donating. Um, the link is in the description below, but as always, this is completely optional and I'm not going to hate you forever if you don't want to. Uh, so yeah, thanks for listening.